everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Boyd. I'll be the moderator for this afternoon session. I'm here from uh, the National Nuclear Security Administration, where I run the Capabilities for Nuclear Intelligence program, as well as the Physics and Engineering Models program under uh, Advanced Simulation and Computing. Our first speaker this afternoon will be Peter Maginot from Texas A&M University. Um, his field is nuclear engineering, um, and he did his practicum at Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory. He'll be speaking to us on cross-section spatial dissertization for nuclear engineering calculations. All right. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so we said the title, so we can keep moving on, so I can put you all to sleep after that nice lunch. Uh, so I'll go through a brief outline. Uh, basically, uh, I'll give some equations of radiation transport, uh, try and better describe what it is that the steady stream of nuclear engineers from Texas A&M keep rambling on about uh, with regards to uh, radiation transport. Uh, go over a problem I encountered in what I thought was going to be my dissertation research and how my uh, dissertation topic changed. Uh, show some numerical schemes like spatial discretizations uh, that, that cause the problem and then that also solve the problem. Uh, show the world's greatest line graphs and then uh, I'll stop. All right, so this beautiful equation here is the uh, seven dimensional, uh, so space, time, angle, and energy uh, Boltzmann transport equation. Uh, we're trying to solve for the angular flux, uh, psi. So you can kind of think of that as like a, a path length rate density in a particular direction. Uh, omega is the direction of particles. Uh, e is the energy of particles. V is their velocity. And the sigmas, sigma t and sigma s here, are uh, interaction rate cross-sections. So you shouldn't think of them so much as, I'm not going to talk about the cross-section of a nuclear reactor. I'm going to talk about uh, how interaction probabilities are discretized in space. Uh, so this equation is really hard to solve. But if we could solve it, or if you want to answer these type of questions, you, you need to solve some form or simplification of the, the full transport equation. So obviously, we solve the transport equation, or usually the diffusion approximation, for trying to determine uh, reactor power output. Uh, where is the heat being made in the reactor? How do I cool it so I don't melt the reactor down? Uh, you know, you can do things like cancer treatment. Am I irradiating the tissue, the, the cancerous tissue, or am I irradiating health, healthy tissue? Uh, you can solve a, an inverse type of flavor for uh, oil and gas exploration if you have a a nuclear equipped uh, drill head. You can do some fun and difficult detection work and try and figure out and characterize your well. Uh, for things like inertial confinement fusion, you, you need to solve the, the radiative transfer equations coupled to some fluid flow, coupled to some other stuff. But you can kind of describe how your uh, the Boltzmann equation is important in describing how you're uh, compressing and heating a fusion fuel pellet. Uh, you can do another inverse type problem. Uh, so what's in that mysterious box coming through the shipping container? Is it plastic toys from China? Or is it illicit nuclear material or, material or something else? All right, so that, the, the, the full transport equation uh, requires much more time than more justice than 20 minutes can give. So today I'm going to talk about the steady state, uh, one spatial dimension, discrete ordinance, uh, transport equation. All right. So the simplification we're, we're going to make here is energy. Uh, we're going to have one group only. We're not going to discretize that energy. Uh, so don't have to worry about that term. Uh, it's not time dependent, so time goes away. Uh, it's one spatial dimension, uh, so that drops to space. And then uh, we're only going to, we're going to treat the angle with the discrete ordinance approximation. And basically what that means is instead of treating the, the full coupled angular dependence of the angular flux, we're going to solve in discrete directions. And then we're going to handle any integral type quantities like you see on this side with just applying the quadrature rule. So then we can get approximations like that. All right, so this is compared to this guy. This is so much simpler, it's not even funny. But there are still ways that we can improve on how that equation is solved. And I think I've done that. 
All right, so I'm going to use uh, discontinuous finite elements to spatially discretize the problem. Uh, you're going to get a system of equation like this. You're going to have a, a matrix L. It's kind of like the gradient operator. Uh, R is like a reaction rate. Uh, it looks like a mass matrix with a, a cross-section kind of weighting function tossed in or not tossed in, as the case may be. And then uh, Q is just the source moments. And we're going to use uh, you know, the standard uh, discontinuous Galeric and finite element framework. So we're approximating the true angular flux with uh, our solution approximation, psi tilde. Uh, psi tilde consists of uh, unknown constants times uh, basis functions. And we're going to use uh, the Lagrange interpolatory basis functions. Uh, so this is a linear system of equations. And order or p here is going to be the uh, polynomial degree of our trial space, so uh, linear, quadratic, et cetera, all polynomials. Uh, we're going to have p plus 1 unknowns for a given spatial discretization. All right. So I mentioned that the, the R matrices uh, have cross-section weighting in them. If cross-section is cell-wise constant, there's no approximation in pulling that sigma out of the integral and just leaving it as a constant in front of the integral. And then you just have R sigma is equal to the cell-wise constant cross-section multiplied by the, the usual mass matrix. All right, so for a lot of problems, th this is no approximation. So anything where you, know, you can basically say, I have one material here, another material there. There's no property variation in between. That's a good approximation. So kind of examples would be uh, shielding type calculations, uh, the inverse material detection type problems, things like that. But there's a large number of problems where pulling out cross-section or assuming it's cell-wise constant is not a good approximation at all. Uh, that's because cross-sections, interaction rate cross-sections, are functions of temperature, density of the material, uh, the burn-up or isotopics of the material, if you're talking like a reactor depletion problem. Uh, and there's examples in uh, both neutronics, which is just solving the uh, steady state neutron transport equation. And then there's also examples in radiative transfer. Radiative transfer. So like in neutronics, uh, you have coupled reactor physics problems or uh, depletion problems. Uh, radiative transfer, you're thinking inertial kind of confinement fusion, astrophysics applications, many others. All right. So what motivated me to look at the spatial, discretiz spatial discretization of cross-sections? Something that, to be honest with you, nuclear engineers just take for granted. Uh, trying to find other considerations was extremely difficult, long, and yielded little fruit. Uh, so when I started the CSGF, I thought I was going to couple uh, uh, discrete ordinance, SN radiative transfer, to uh, some work we're doing at A&M with uh, an entropy-based artificial viscosity hydro equations, and then solve all that together and have a beautiful graph maker and things. All right, so my master's and my background before my dissertation was uh, solving uh, this guy in gory detail. So the, the logical extension or you know, building blocks climbing up the ladder to a finished PhD would be to uh, a try out radiative transfer. It's just slightly different. All we're adding is a temperature dependence equation. And uh, that was going to work well. I'd do it at MATLAB. Then I'd put in C++. And everything was going to be great. Uh, so what I expected to do was run a test problem, uh, a Marshak wave test problem, which basically consists of a very cold material getting heated from, by a laser impinging on the side. And I expected to see something like this, uh, where you have, this is the radiation energy density plot. So this looks totally nice, nice and smooth, matches uh, a published uh, radiation diffusion uh, paper pretty well, uh, no problems. But then I got this nonsense in the material temperature equation. Uh, you know, I don't have any diffusion uh, for the rate of transfer, just uh, the material absorbing radiation and emitting uh, radiation uh, is the only heat transfer mechanism. And for some reason, when I plotted my temperature profile, I got this what I'll call bladed nonsense, which basically just these, these large non-monotonic discontinuities between cells 
when I'm expecting something that mirrors that more or less. Uh, so I had to ask myself why. Uh, I thought maybe I have an error in the code. I didn't feel I had an error in the code. I looked, I looked, I rewrote the same thing so many times uh, that I was going crazy. And so I had to figure out what to do. All right, so these are the, the 1D gray radiative transfer equations. And you can see it looks a lot like the uh, transport equation. Uh, you have the time dependence tossed back in, and you have a nonlinear source term here. And then you've also got uh, the material temperature equation. Oh, boy. All right, so basically, this is driven by an interaction rate. Uh, radiative transfer is a lot more complicated. It's time dependent. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beast to try and solve. So my idea was to find a neutronics problem uh, that exhibits the same behavior as the radiative transfer thing where I had the blading. So this plot is created because there is a uh, opacity or cross-section in radiative transfer is uh, usually kind of considered to be 1 over t cubed if you're looking for a nice analytic uh, model. So when the material is heated up, cross-sections on the neighborhood of 1, when it's cold, uh, it's about 10 to the 12th. And obviously, right here at the front, that's a huge uh, cross-section change in a short amount of time. All right, so I'll skip that. All right, so let's see. All right, uh, it's not either. All right, so I think of this test problem as just a, a pure absorber, so there's no scattering. I'm going to make the cross-section exponential in space. There is an easy analytic solution. Uh, and I'm going to look at the interaction rate because I feel like that the temperature equation for radiative transfer is driven by interaction rate. So maybe if an interaction term, so maybe if I look at a neutronics problem interaction rate, uh, I'll, I'll see something that'll explain the blading and the temperature profile. And lo and behold, I do. Uh, so for this problem, the red dashed line is the analytic solution. Uh, the blue dashed line is the finite element solution when you assume a cell-wise constant cross-section. So on the left, you have the radiation profile, the angular flux. On the right, you have the interaction rate, where you see the left is kind of like my radiative transfer problem. Uh, it's relatively smooth. Yeah, it's got some discontinuities, but it's a low resolution. And on the right, I see all this blading. So I've found my neutronics problem that exhibits blading seen in radiative transfer, suggesting that my radiative transfer results might not be junk after all. All right, so surely if this is something that I was able to produce with an easy, easy problem, that this must have been noted before. Uh, and the answer is, well, it's probably been in calculations. It's never been reported, though, because if you look here, if you plot the cell average at cell centers, like you do on this plot, so this is from the previous page. This is the interaction rate when you plot the average interaction rate at cell center, then interpolate. You, you don't see any blading. It looks relatively smooth. Yeah, I know it doesn't look right here, but this is five spatial cells, so give me a break. There's going to be uh, some, some unsmoothness. All right? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of people that say there's issues with uh, SN, discontinuous finite element. You have ray effects with the angle. You have negativities with the... Uh, with the spatial discretization, this is probably just another problem where you know finite element is failing. So is the finite element failing? Well, no, it's not. Uh, here, we plot in black the analytic solution to the problem with cell-wise constant cross-sections. So the analytic solution that uses, sees basically blocks of material with the volume average cross-section as opposed to the analytic spatially varying, continuously varying cross-section. And you see that the black line, yeah, it doesn't quite match up with the, the blue line, but it's pretty much on top as we would ex expect, or not as we expect. But it, it's close enough to the blue that we say that the, uh, the finite element isn't having a problem. It's that we're solving the wrong problem. You know, the cell-wise constant approximation is not a good approximation for spatially varying cross-section problems. So is there a solution to this problem? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, these self-lumping methods, so methods that basically don't do anything that smart. They just, instead of pulling out cross-section from the uh, R integral and assuming a cell-wise constant, uh, they just use numerical quadrature to evaluate the integral. 
uh, don't exhibit blading. So here I have a, a linear finite element space again with the self lumping and just a, a left and right vertex point. Uh, the radiation profile, maybe not as good. Uh, that's expected because this self lumping scheme is a little bit less order, less accurate for uh, cell wise constant cross section problems. But when we look at the interaction rate, uh, the green line, the, the self lumping scheme, doesn't exhibit any of this behavior. And uh, I think we, we've solved the problem, basically. Uh, these self lumping schemes can be made. Uh, arbitrarily accurate if you want to increase your polynomial to arbitrary degree. Uh, but you also need to probably switch your interpolation point. Uh, so instead of the usual equally spaced point, if you use uh, higher order quadrature points like Gauss points or Lobato quadrature points, uh, you can get P plus one order accuracy, which is the highest you're expecting to see, versus uh, for the angular flux convergence, uh, with assuming a cell-wise constant cross-section in a problem with spatially varying cross-section, you're limited to at most second-order L2 convergence of the angular flux there. Um, likewise, for the interaction rate, uh, SL Lobato and SL Gauss are P plus 1 accurate. Lobato is a little less accurate than Gauss. That's expected as well, because Gauss is a better quadrature or more accurate quadrature. Whereas the constant cross-section scheme is only first order accurate in space, no matter how high I bump up my DFEM trial space degree. And when I put the self-lumping scheme into the same rated transfer problem, I solve my problem. Uh, radiation smooth, that was given before. Temperature is smooth. And uh, all is right in the world. And with that, I'd just like to say thanks. Uh, Thanks to my wife, Kelly, and my son, Peter, and uh, our dog, Sally, for putting up with me, I guess. Uh, my advisors, Jean Argusa and Jim Morrell, and uh, especially to the Krell Institute staff and the DOE CSGF. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now.